This is a, a review of the test two for the Z262. And I'm gonna to try to make this really quick. So what we're gonna do now is we'll just go over the uh, multiple choice questions. Okay, multiple choice questions. For which charge distribution would be appropriate to use Gauss's law? A point charge, a long wire, a large flat sheet, or all of the above? Well, when do you use Gauss's law? Use Gauss's law when there is symmetry. Is there symmetry associated with point charge? Yes, spherical symmetry. A long wire? Yes, there is cylindrical symmetry. And a large flat sheet? Yes, you have reflective symmetry. You have symmetry in, in uh, X and Y. Okay, so all of the above is the answer for number one. Number two, 17 separate charges are located within two centimeters of a point in space. The flux through a four centimeter radius sphere centered at that point is 2.1 times 10 to the minus 11 newton meter squared per coulomb. What's the flux through a cube centered at the same point with a side length of eight centimeters? So we've got something like this. We have 17 of these charges. They're all within two centimeters of some point in space, which I'm going to conveniently choose as my origin. And we know the flux through a four centimeter radius sphere, which means they are all contained within that we know that this flux is a certain value, um, 2.1 times 10 to the minus 11. Okay, so we know that this is equal to E dot dA integrated over that sphere. Okay, um, now we're asked, all right, well, what's the flux through this? Some cube that's located here, the cube is eight centimeters on a side. And um, so what's the flux through that? Well, what is this flux, E dot dA, through this closed surface, this sphere? You know it's just equal, by Gauss's law, it's equal to the Q enclosed over epsilon zero. So whatever number this is, we know it is equal to the Q enclosed over epsilon zero. And then the question is, does this Q enclosed change when I move to this, this um, square, when I move to this cube? And the answer is, of course, it doesn't. It doesn't change, and therefore, no change means the flux this equation is still true, E dot dA, Q enclosed over epsilon zero is always true. Q enclosed has not changed, therefore the flux is not going to change. So 2.1 times 10 to the minus 11 newton meters squared per coulomb is the answer for us. So, oh, I mean, I mean thing went to sleep, but I just, I'll just let it. All right, number three, in the previous question, that is this one that we have right here, what is the strength of the electric field everywhere on the surface of the four centimeter radius Gaussian sphere? Not enough information to say 1 times 10 to the minus 9 newtons per coulomb, 4 times 10 to the minus 10 newtons per coulomb, or none of the above. Well, look at this charge distribution, these 17 charges, 17 separate charges. Do we know anything about their symmetry? The answer is we do not. These all could be clustered all over here. They could all, they could all be contained there, or they could all be clustered over here, or they could be all spread out evenly around the sphere. I mean, we have no, they could all be combined in one tiny, tiny little spot. We have no idea what the symmetry is. Therefore, we do not have enough, we cannot say anything, even though we know what the flux is through the surface, we cannot say anything about the electric field strength at any given point. As a matter of fact, we don't even know which of these are positive and which are negative charges. So no, the answer is not enough information to say. All right, moving on to number four. Electric field in the given region is constant. What is the potential in that region? And our choices are not enough information to say. It is constant. It is increasing or decreasing linearly. It is zero. Well, we have an electric field in some region that is constant. So we have this thing that's E zero and it's just going in some direction. Well, you guys now know this is extra information out. You guys now know that that means it is perpendicular. That, should, that is not drawn representatively, but um, it's perpendicular to the equipotential lines, which means we have a gradient in the, um, in the electric potential that is in this direction or a negative gradient in the, this direction because you will recall that E is defined as being equal to, for constant E, delta V over delta X. Okay, so if this E is not changing, what does that mean? That means we have E delta X equals delta V. All right, so if E delta X equals, I'm sorry, and I'm choosing this as the X direction, in case you guys did not get that. 
which means then I can stop worrying about the e dot dl. I just know that this is e e delta x. Okay, so well, what is this an expression? What's this? What is this? Is it? Um, where are we? Number four. Do I have enough information to say? Well, e is constant, so I have I know something. So I can I have some information. Let's see. Do we know that this delta v is constant? Well, no. There's a delta x here, which means that as we move this V is going to change, or our change in potential is going to change. And so it's not constant. Is it increasing or decreasing linear? Well, look at this. What is this? Here is the equation of a line. Mx <laughs> equals delta V. And here, in this case, the M is just E, and the X is just delta X. But this is the equation of a line. Now, we don't know whether this m is positive or negative. So it could be either increasing or decreasing linearly, but it's doing one of those two things. And the, our final choice was it is zero, but we're done. It's for is, uh, option C, it's increasing or decreasing linearly. All right, there is a constant electric field between an infinite plane of charge at x equals minus d and another plane at x equals plus d. An electron is placed in the middle at x equals 0, and it moves to x equals minus d. Which plate has the higher voltage? Okay, so there are a bunch of different ways to think about this, but I'm just going to pick one, and we're going to go with this. We are going to move, we, just like a rock dropping from a cliff, we are going to move from a region of high potential energy to a region of low potential energy. So. We've got something here. We've got a plus D and a minus D. I did this backwards, but we'll, we'll go with it. Okay, we've got a plus D or minus D. We drop an electron. I'm going to drop it right up here. We drop an electron here. In which direction does it go? Um, moves to X equals minus D. It's going to go this way. Okay, so this, our E, our electron is going to go in this direction. Well, like I said, this is like dropping a rock from a cliff. It's going from a higher potential energy to a lower potential energy. Well, what is the potential energy? The potential energy is just Q times V. But what is our Q? Our Q in this case is negative. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and write like that, minus QEV. So we know this is the charge of an electron and it is negative. And QEV, so this is our potential energy. So the question is, if we go from a lower potential, excuse me, a higher potential energy to a lower potential energy, what kind of motion is that? Is it moving towards a higher V or a lower V? Well, we have a minus sign right here, so that means this number will be a lower potential energy when V is higher, when V is higher. And so our answer is, let's see, where do we move? We move to X equals minus D. Therefore, the, the plate at X equals minus D has a higher voltage because that will be a lower potential energy. All right, uh, number six, charge in an electric field, so initial velocity V1, find the velocity V2. If V2 is less than V1, which of the following must be true? The potential energy doesn't change between start and finish. It has more potential energy in its initial position. It has more potential energy in its final position. Not enough information to say. Well, you guys know energy is conserved. And I'm going to write it in this notation. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that. Uh, I'll say T plus U, where T is often what we use for kinetic energy. So this just means the kinetic energy, and this is the potential energy. So the kinetic energy and the potential energy are always, um, they're a constant. So what happens here? We go from V2, I'm sorry, we go from V1, an initial velocity, to another velocity, V2, which is smaller. So our T is 1 half mv1 squared, our initial T1, plus some u1. Then we have this must be equal to 1 half mv2 squared plus u2. All right, well now let's just rearrange these terms and we're going to have, let's see, what? yeah, let's do it this way. 1 half mv2 
v1 squared minus 1 half mv2 squared equals u2 minus u1. So what is this? Is this a positive number or is it a negative number or is it zero? Well, we are given the fact that v2 is smaller than v1. v2 smaller than v1 means this is going to be a positive number. So if it's a positive number, we are moving from a region, then this is a num positive number, which means we're moving from a region of low potential energy to a region of higher potential energy. So it has more potential energy in its final position. That is answer number C. All right, number seven. A charge of Q1 moves from point A to point B. It gains a potential energy of 128 EV. Charge Q2 equals Q1, excuse me, negative Q1 divided by 8. Charge Q2 moves from point B to point A. What is its change in potential energy? So this is what we have. We have some point A, and we're going to have a Q1 that somehow gets over here to point B. So Q1 is going to make this journey in this direction. And as it does, Q1 is going to gain, it will go plus 128 EV, right? Where am I? Oh, yeah, plus 128 EV. Okay, now we're going to get a Q2, and we're going to take this Q2, and we're going to go from here back this way to point A. So Q2 is now moving from B to A. So what do we know? If this is potential energy change, we know Q1 times VA, the voltage at point A, minus Q1 V B, I don't know, make sure that's on your screen. Okay, Q1 V A minus Q1 V B, we know that this equals plus 128 EV. Um, let me make sure I did that right because I might have that minus sign wrong. Let's see. We're trying to compare the final to V. So I do have this wrong. So we're going to, I'm just going to go ahead and make this a minus sign because what we're trying to look at is the final potential energy minus the initial potential energy. So if we did that, it, we would gain 128 EV. So I just have a minus sign. It doesn't really matter. Well, this is what we know. We know Q1 times VA minus VB equals minus 128 EV. All right, now we're going to do the same thing, except now we're going to go, as a matter of fact, this is, this is actually a reason for leaving it in this form. Because now we're going to put a Q2 in here. And we're going to, with our Q2, we are now going to go, we are going from, we're going from VB to VA. So this is indeed, this will be our final potential, and this will be our initial potential. So whatever we get here, this is going to be our answer. We know that this is going to equal, um, how do, I, how do I do this right? Um, oh yeah, 128 EV over Q1 is equal to VA minus VB. So this is Q2 over Q1. In other words, I just divided both these sides by Q1. So VA minus VB equals minus 128 EV over Q1. So I'm gonna, now Q2 times this is this, then just minus 128 EV. All right. Now we just have to substitute in Q2, our value for Q2. Well, what is our value for Q2? It is just minus Q1 over 8, Q1 here, minus 128 EV. So Q1's cancel. We have a minus sign. And so we have an 8 that we need to divide by here. And when we divide by this, what do we get? We get 8. Oh man, oh man, that's, what is this, 16? Yeah, sounds about right. Um, does that sound right? I'm, now I'm, I'm panicking on my, on my algebra, or my, my arithmetic. Um, okay, and so we have 16 EV. This is minus in here. It's minus out here. So those minuses change. So what happens to, to our charge Q2? 
it gains plus 16 EV. That is option number letter B. So that's the answer for that one. All right, number eight. A Gaussian surface surrounds some charge distribution for all portions of the surface that contribute to the flux integral. Pay attention to that phrase for all portions of the surface that contribute to the flux integral, what must be true for Gauss's law to be useful? The angle between E and, dot and DA must not change. The value of E at the surface should not change. Neither A nor B must be true. Both A and B must be true. And the answer is both A and B must be true. I think you guys know this basically. The, the, in order for Gauss's law to be useful, we want to be able to take this E dot DA integral and we want to be able to pull this out. This is some E0 times our area, whatever this area is. And we know this is going to be with a Q enclosed over epsilon 0. We cannot do this if E changes its value or E changes its relationship to DA. But this is the only way that we can start from just our knowledge, uh, you know, just our knowledge of the charge there and whatever surface we are using. Um, this is the only way we can go from this to get E0 is if, or, or to go to get the value of E if it is an E0 that is always in the same relationship with, the, with respect to DA. So both A and B must be true. Nine, a long wire extends along the x-axis. Gaussian cylinder centered on the x-axis is much shorter than the wire. Which of the following is true? You can ignore the flux through the end caps because E is perpendicular to DA. You can ignore the flux through the end caps because the Gaussian cylinder has a small radius. You have to calculate the flux through the end caps or none of the above. Well, here's where we are. At this situation right here, we've got some Gaussian surface. This is not a real surface. Here's our wire. It goes on forever. And the question is why, is, why is it that we can ignore the flux here? Or maybe that we won't be able to ignore the flux here, in which the answer would be none of the above. Well, once again, we're just going to look at symmetry of this and say, gosh, look at this. We have, um, we have an E field that is always radially outward from the wire. The DA for the end caps is always along the wire. Therefore, these are always perpendicular and that's why we can ignore those end caps. Now, you could possibly make an argument for the size of the end caps being small and sometimes we do make that argument, but the one that's always true is you can uh, choice A. You can ignore the flux through the end caps because E is perpendicular to DA. Okay, we're at the last multiple choice. An uncharged hollow metal sphere has an inner radius of R1 and an outer radius of R2. A charge of plus Q is put in the center. All right. So let's go ahead. Ah. So an uncharged hollow metal sphere. So we've got something like this, and we've got some R1 and some R2. Okay, uh, yep, charge of plus Q is put right here, a plus Q. Well, what happens in the conductor? Charges are free to move. If plus Q is here, what is going to happen? Minus Q is going to spread out all over this inner surface. Okay, well, if minus Q spreads out here, what does that mean? This is a neutral hollow metal sphere. It's uncharged to begin with, which means that if, if minus Q is spreading out here, that means plus Q is spreading out there. Okay, so that's what we have. And now we are asked, um, what is true? A charge of minus Q is distributed on the inner shell. There is a growing electric field inside the conductor between R1 and R2. The voltage inside the conductor increases from R1 to R2 or all of the above. Okay, charge of minus Q is distributed on the inner shell. Is that true? Yes. There's a growing electric field inside the conductor. Well, look at this right here. We'll make this Gaussian surface. Sorry, everything's looking like dashes. I should try to do a different, different pattern. Um, this is our Gaussian surface. How much charge is enclosed in there? Plus Q and minus Q, no net charge enclosed. The E inside this conductor is equal to zero because it's equal to zero. Um, so 
than growing electric field inside the conductor? No, we do not have a growing electric field inside the conductor, so it's not B. The voltage inside the conductor increases from R1 to R2. Well, if E equals zero, E equals zero, what is E defined as? E is defined as minus delta V over delta, I'm going to just go ahead and say R in this case, because that's where our symmetry is, minus delta V over delta R. And so if E is equal to zero, we know delta R is not zero and not infinite. It's just going from R1 to R2. So what must delta V be? The answer is delta V must be equal to Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, delta V must be equal to zero. So we do not uh, we do not have a voltage that increases inside the conductor from R1 to R2. Now, it doesn't mean that V is equal to zero. Remember that. Our setting of, of, of voltage is completely arbitrary. We can set that to be whatever we want. But what it does mean is there is no change in voltage throughout it when we go from R1 to R2 or out R2 to R1. Okay, those are the multiple choice ones. I hope those were pretty straightforward for you.